Well, good morning. I'm Pastor Chris Myros here at Glory Baptist Church. And I'm so glad you're willing to pause your, what I imagine is probably relaxing morning on a Sunday morning here. And just take some time and gather together with us for worship. Just wanted to do a few things here before we get into the sermon. Share with you a few uh, announcements and then a little bit of prayer concerns. And then off into the sermon we'll go. Uh, a couple of real quick things. First, a big thanks uh, to Roy Eggstead. On Wednesday, Roy was at church here cooking and preparing takeout and to-go meals and uh, had people pick those up and then delivered those as well. And he served something like 30 people some, some meals. And um, from all reports, they were delicious and enormously appreciated. So a huge thank you to Roy for helping us um, serve one another and love our neighbors and just to be a blessing and to be generous for people. Uh, great job, Roy. Roy is always willing to cook. He's a great cook, and we are blessed to have him as a, a member at Glory Baptist Church. And he uh, gives great leadership to all sorts of different things that involve food in our church. So thank you, Roy. As well as thank you to all who came by uh, yesterday on Saturday for Sunny Flowers' funeral. As we know, we can't all gather together. Not everybody could come. We could not have an assembled funeral. I have posted the video from the funeral online if you would like to watch that. It's posted both uh, to our Facebook page here as well as online on YouTube. If you look for Glory Baptist Church in Aiken, you'll find it. And uh, the, the, the sermon and, and I guess the gathered time that we had together as the family um, is there for your viewing if you would like that. And thank you to Mary Nutting in particular. Mary organized all of the cars and all of the people to come and uh, line up in front of their, their place and then drive by the cemetery at the conclusion uh, of the graveside service. And I don't know if there was 50 or 60 cars, there was a lot, and I don't know how many people were in each one, but there were lots of people that came out um, expressing just their gratitude for the impact that Sunny's life had on them, sharing their love with the Flowers family and their time of loss. Uh, thank you for all of the, the signs that people were carrying and the flags on the vehicles and just coming out and, and being the church. So good job, Glory folks, and good job to everybody because I know there was people who weren't Glory members that were part of that as well. And if you're watching this, thank you as well. Uh, the, the Flowers family was blessed and touched by it and it was a, a very cool thing. So thank you for that. Uh, today is the first Sunday of the month. Normally we would collect a benevolence offering. If you would like to give to benevolence, you have the option of making a, a benevolence offering in the online giving system. You could also certainly uh, send in a check or, or whatever might work for you there. Uh, we do appreciate it. If you haven't signed up for online giving, uh, easy, simple process to do, very safe system, it's secure. If you need any help getting signed up for online giving, let myself know or you can talk with David Baker and we will make sure that you get plugged into that system. If you go online to the church's website, top right hand corner, if you're in a uh, computer like a Mac or a PC, top right hand corner, it'll say give, click on that and it'll give you all the instructions there. If you're on a cell phone or a tablet, it might be underneath the three little bars um, at the top corner of your screen and then it'll say give and you can click on that. If you have a meeting coming up and you would like to meet online and use Zoom, uh, let me know if your committee is going to gather and I can make sure that we have that set up and ready to go so that our committees can continue meeting. If you would like to just get together with a few people online and have a time of chat, that's great. We can do that too. We, we've got a lot of digital functionality and if you are feeling a little distanced and isolated and lonely and you want some time together with other people from glory, we can make that happen. Just let me know. I've been doing daily devotionals and prayers online. Uh, would love to have you jump in any time of the week on Facebook and, and participate in there. It, it reaches a lot of people and it's meaningful to a lot of people that uh, I am able to do that. Uh, with that, there are a number of prayer concerns. Of course, keep the Flowers family in your prayer concerns. Having lost Sunny this past week, uh, Lila and the kids and grandkids and even great grandkids, keep them all in your prayers. Um, he will be dearly missed. 
lots of other ongoing health concerns, many of which, you know, started before even the COVID-19 pandemic issues. Um, lift all of those things up into prayer, be it for, for healing, for various people, uh, protection, all sorts of other things. Uh, Marie Pettigo continues to improve and is doing quite good, and we're praising God for that. Uh, pray for Mark and Vicki Daniels' daughter, Shelley, who is expecting a baby. Um, they've asked for prayer for her. Continue to pray for folks like Gil Gilbertson with ongoing issues. Continue to pray for Matt and Adrian Hurd, who are also expecting, and um, pray that little boy continues to grow and that he continues to thrive and be healthy. And uh, pray for all those who are fighting COVID-19, of course. It's a, a scary illness, and um, eventually, I believe, it will probably impact all of us. We will know somebody who's had it, and uh, just pray against that illness. Pray for the EMTs, medical staff, first responders, police, fire, everyone who comes into contact with it. Pray even for our, our gas station attendants and grocery store clerks who, who again, are, are really kind of put out there on the front line. Continue to pray for our soldiers. Continue to pray for our leaders. Continue to pray for our church. Continue to pray for one another. Lots of things to be in prayer for. And uh, we are thankful that we are a church of prayer. If you ever need prayer, let us know. Uh, drop a comment. Uh, send me a note. You can submit online on the church's website if you need prayer, and we will lift those prayers up. And so with that, those are your announcements. Uh, you can find other things in the bulletin to pray for, other informational items. If you need something, if we can bless you, if we can love you, if we can serve you here at Glory Baptist Church, please let us know. Uh, we would delight in the opportunity uh, to do so. Let us continue on in worship. Thanks for stopping in. God bless. Turn with me to John 19, if you would. We'll start in verse 16, and I'll read down to verse 42. Our sermon today is to set up the Easter sermon for next week. This is Palm Sunday, but that won't be our focus this year, and sorry if that disappoints you. The children's lesson that I linked, there's a video um, that is on this Facebook event page. If uh, you would like to know more about Palm Sunday, that video actually does a very good job of covering it, and I would encourage you to watch it even if you're not a child. But today, we move towards the cross. We come to John's account of the crucifixion, starting in verse 16. So if you've got a Bible, grab your Bible. If you don't have a Bible on you, you can use your iPhone, iPad, whatever you might have. U version is always a, a good option for a Bible app to to get the Bible. I use it uh, literally on a daily basis. It's a very useful tool that I use on both my computer as well as on my phone. But it's going to be John 19, and I'm going to read that for you, uh, starting in 16 on down through verse 42. So here we go. So Pilate delivered Jesus over the, to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the Place of the Skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, the king of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven into one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman! Behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. Verse 28. 
After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, and of the other who had been crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you may also believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, They will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus, they bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial customs of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they lay Jesus there. John's particular description of the crucifixion has a unique twist to it. John, I think, is aware of some, if not all, of the other synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and he most certainly would have been aware of what Mark, for example, had written about the crucifixion. And so John doesn't necessarily repeat all of the details that you have in the other Gospel accounts. John, for example, says nothing about Simon of Cyrene, who evidently at some point along what we sometimes refer to as the Via Dolorosa, uh, took, this man took this beam that Jesus had been carrying and, and, and bore it and carried it in his place to the place of execution. It's a remarkable thing, actually, if you think about it, that somehow we as Christians, we glory in the cross, right? I mean, it seems on the face of it a, a very odd thing, doesn't it? I mean, uh, imagine for a second if we were to carry around with us uh, the emblem of, of a golden electric chair, right? Or, 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 or a lethal injection syringe, or, or perhaps just, you know, a little guillotine in your pocket or something, right? The very thought of that is, frankly, a little repulsive. It offends our common decency. I wondered if I should even give those as examples. And yet, as Christians, we don't hesitate to, to love and honor and cherish the cross of Christ. We can't help it, actually. The language that, that John uses about the crucifixion is the language that John has been preparing all along the way. He's been preparing us for this. It's the language of exaltation. Do you remember way, way back in, in John and in John chapter 3, uh, the encounter that he had with Nicodemus? That same Nicodemus appears again here. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. It's the language of exaltation, of lifting something up. Later on, John records the, word, the words of Jesus, and he says, If I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men and women from all parts of the world to myself, if I am lifted up. Yes, lifted up, hoisted onto the cross. But John loves a double entendre. When you read John, look for those double meanings. Yes, hoisted up onto a cross, but in a very real way, 
exalted as well. I mean, the whole discussion, uh, do you remember in the preceding section with, with Pilate and Caiaphas and Aeneas, right? What, what John has been singling out in, in the mockery of the trial, do you remember that? It was the very statement of Pilate. Behold the king, right? John, having prepared us now, is going to describe the cross. Not in terms and in, in the details of, of suffering, but actually he's describing what's happening here with the idea that, that actually Jesus is being exalted here. So that in verses 17 through 22, we have the trials of the cross, and, and in the way in which the cross is seen as the, the, the king's enthronement, in fact. Then in verses 23 and 24, the cross is seen as the kings. And yes, the kings. It's seen as the kings disrobing. And then in verses 25 through 27, the way the cross is seen is as the king's very last acts. Then in verses 28 through the end, the way the cross is seen is as the king's royal burial. Follow me through these four different acts that we find, these acts of the kings. Yes, behold the king as he goes to crucifixion, as he goes eventually on then into burial. Number one in your notes. The whole section in verses 17 through 22 focuses on the sign. The traditional sign that would be placed on the cross of the one who was to be executed. John, however, focuses on something that the other Gospels don't focus on. The others say that this plaque reads, this is the king of the Jews. But John alone notices something. That, that actually this plaque, uh, this statement at, at the head of the cross, it says, this is Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. And Pilate was insistent that this is what it should read. That it was in Hebrew, that it was in Latin, it was in Greek, right? Hebrew representing the official language of Judea, Latin representing the official Latin language of the, the Roman Empire, and Greek, of course, was the common language, the, the street language, the, the lingua franca. And John has set the scene here. It's, it's the Passover time. Uh, this crucifixion, it takes place right on the main road going in and out of Jerusalem. And John doesn't mention along the way Simon of Cyrene. Mark does in his gospel alluding to uh, two sons of his, Rufus and Alexander, which uh, these men were definitely, or evidently at least, known to the church. And perhaps Simon of Cyrene, we don't know, was a believer. Uh, uh, perhaps he was a disciple. And contrary to the wishes of the Jews, and, and, and basically out of spite against them, Pontius Pilate has this, this placard, this, this, this Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews, right? And John is seeing fulfilled here, just as he had done in the previous section, just as he had done in, in the illusion of Caiaphas and the high priest, that, that one man should die in place of the whole. John sees here that despite themselves, that actual prophecy is being fulfilled here. That this one, Jesus, was indeed the appointed king raised up on behalf of the people. It was all beginning to happen as the, the nails were being hammered into his hands and into his feet. And John wants you to see, as you are moved by that event here, that this is the beginning of the exaltation and the enthronement of Jesus, that, that Jesus is king, that this is the king. Point number two. Act number two. Then in verses 23 and 24, John describes how, how the soldiers, as they divide these clothes, that they'd drawn lots. The other gospel writers say uh, his headgear, his, his outer cloak, his waistband, sandals, you know, both of them. And then there's this tunic, right? This seamless robe, this perfectly woven robe, this tunic. And rather than destroy it, they draw their lots to see who would come into possession of this garment. And John says in verse 24 that they were fulfilling the scripture, two scriptures in fact. Our great king, 
nowhere more clearly displays the significance of his kingship than in the way in which in his very final hours, in fact, in some of his very final moments, he is disrobed. He is disrobed as he makes his way onto the cross. Do you remember in John 13, in the upper room, when the disciples are sitting there arguing which one of them is going to be the greatest, right? They're sitting there having an argument. What does Jesus do? Jesus removes his outer garment. The garment that now the the soldiers had cast lots for. And he took a, a servant's towel and he wrapped it around himself and he washed the disciples' feet as a symbol of what he was going to do upon the cross. And now he takes the last steps down into his humiliation. The king, in his humiliation, the soldiers don't understand it. The Jews, they don't see it. But Jesus' last garment is being stripped away from him. And yes, appalling as it is to think of it, he was probably crucified naked. Appalling as that is to think, having nothing to cover him. That may be why we see when Isaiah, when he says in Isaiah 53 that, that we uh, avert our gaze from him. And do you remember the last thing the Bible says before the description of mankind's fall way back in, in the book of Genesis? What's the last thing that is said before the description of the fall? That Adam and Eve were naked and they were not ashamed. And they were not ashamed. They had nothing to be embarrassed about. Clothing comes after the fall. And that's deeply significant. And it's John saying, as he brings all of these strands of of biblical teachings together, that Jesus on the cross is going back to the beginning. He's going back to where Adam was. He's, He's going to the cross having fulfilled all righteousness and having obeyed the covenant of works that Adam had broken. And he's going there naked as Adam was in the Garden of Eden. But unlike Adam... He's covered in sin. He's covered with our sin. And going, bearing Adam's shame, and bearing Adam's guilt, and therein meeting the judgment of God, at the cross, Jesus meets the unmitigated judgment of God. You know when Paul says in in Romans 1, the wrath of of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and the ungodliness of me. You have to understand that that wrath is mitigated. It's not the full wrath of God or, or the whole world would be consumed. It's a mitigated wrath. It's a wrath that that holds back. But on the cross, that wrath doesn't hold back. Do you remember how Paul puts it in the very same epistle in Romans? That that he spared not his son. Many of us know the instinct that lies within us as parents to spare our children. To spare them even punishment. To spare them pain. To spare them suffering. And he spared not his son. He didn't spare, but freely delivered him up for us all. And so Jesus on the cross is disrobed and exposed in all of his nakedness for the purpose of our redemption. Move on to verse 25, Act 3. In verse 25 and in the following verses, and this deserves, frankly, more time than I can give it today. I mean, I could do a whole series of sermons, but let me just allude to a few of those points. Because one of the first things that he does is is Jesus begins a new family. 
He does this extraordinary thing. And, and he points to John, uh, the writer of this gospel, the one who's telling this story. And Jesus points to him and he says, he says, John, behold your mother. And he points to his own mother and he says, and notice how he doesn't use the word mother here, but it's woman now. And he's saying that, meaning no disrespect to her. He's not speaking to her to be disrespectful by calling her woman, but he's no longer speaking to her as her son. He's speaking to her as the king as the divine Lord, as the mediator for mankind, distancing himself from that highly personal relationship that he had had with his own mother. And he says, woman, behold your son. Maybe you remember back in in Mark's gospel in chapter 3, Jesus asked this question. He says, who is my mother? And he answers the question, who is my mother? He says, "These these are my mother, These are my brothers and these are my sisters. These are the family of God. And the one who believes in me belongs to this new family of mine. And it's a a beautiful thing that's happening here. From the, from the heights of the cross, lifted up from the ground as he now was, he gives just, just a little clue, just a, a little peek of what his redemptive work has been all about. It's the creation of a new family. It's the creation of the church. It's the creation of the family of God. But also he's completing the tasks of his ministry along the way. He utters two words that John alludes to. The first is, I am thirsty. We'll come back to that in a minute. But the second one is teleo. It is finished. It is finished. That all of it, every bit of it, is complete. That all is done. That every demand that had been made of this man, Jesus, our covenant mediator, had been fulfilled. That the the law had been upheld. That righteousness had been maintained. And he's offered himself as the substitute for his people. And it is now finished. Amazing that through all of the suffering that he's gone through, he has this consciousness that he is here about his father's business and that he has completed it. That the the task is done. That the, the work is now over. And it says that his His bones are not broken. Why is that significant? Why is it significant that his bones weren't broken? Because John says it fulfills Scripture for one thing. And the significant lies in the laws that were associated with the Passover. See, Jesus is the Passover lamb. And one of the requirements of the Passover lambs was that they were to be perfect, right? You couldn't come to the Passover and offer a lamb that only had one ear or or one that only had three legs. It had to be perfect. It had to be perfect. And here on the cross is the Passover lamb whose blood delivers the people of God from the angel of death. Jesus is the true Passover lamb. And on the cross, he is standing in our place of judgment. And then there's this reference uh, to this spear that is thrust into Jesus' side. And John says, and and it's so full of meaning for John, that, that out of his side flows blood and water. John's interest is not medical here. John's interest, you may remember, goes all the way back to John chapter 7. You remember at the, at the Feast of Tabernacles, right? How John had said that when the priests, they had carried those golden pitchers from the pool of, of Siloam, um, filled with water, and they'd brought them to the people. And then on the seventh day, when that, that water was poured, suddenly Jesus shouts out that in, in the midst of the temple there that if any man should thirst, you know, if any man here, if you thirst, let him come to me. And John made an allusion there in John chapter 7 that what Jesus was saying on that occasion was, was that out of, him, out of him flowed this, 
river of living water. And it was a, a reference to the Holy Spirit. It was a reference, I think, actually to Pentecost. And I think for John, in a strange way, the fact that out of his side flows this blood and water was yet another fulfillment of the promise that Jesus had made. That the, the consequence of Jesus' dying and rising, that the Holy Spirit then would descend on the day of Pentecost. And for John, that is deeply significant. You see why then that, that, that Jesus then says, I thirst. Do you see why Jesus says, I thirst? Because back in John chapter 7, at the promise of the Holy Spirit, what had Jesus said? He said, if any man should thirst, let him come to me. Let him come to me, and out of me, out of my side, will flow rivers of living water for you. And Jesus here is thirsty so that our thirst may be quenched. Jesus bears the curse of thirst in order that our thirst may be fully quenched in him by his Holy Spirit. Now, of course, there's more and more and more, more here than I have time to, to get into. But even from the cross, do you see that the king in his final acts, his ruling and his reigning and his pointing to the future, uh, the outpouring of the Spirit and the emerging of the church of the New Testament is all taking place right here on the cross. And then there's this final thing, uh, a fourth thing, and that is the king's death. Two men, two different men ask Pontius Pilate's permission to bury the body of Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And the point that John draws attention to is the amount of spices that they bring. It's something like 75 to 100 pounds of spices. And whatever the exact amount was, it was the amount that was fit for a king. And that's the very point that John's making. This was far, far, far more than was required for any ordinary burial. And Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, these two kind of secret by night disciples, they now understand, right? And they emerge from the shadows now. And at this moment, they declare such courage and such determination because, because we see it here. We see it now. Whatever had been holding them back before, they're no longer held back by it, right? They're no longer being held back because now there's this king here. And, and, and this king, their king, needs to be buried. And so they take a stand with their king. Do you see that? They take their stand with a dead corpse. They take their stand with this dead corpse because they realize now finally that he is the king. And because of that, he is worthy of a king's burial. And so these two men stand and identify themselves with Jesus. And that's what this passage is calling for, isn't it? That's what John is really doing here. He writes all of this in order that we might believe in Jesus Christ. And then in believing that we would then find eternal life. John writes this entirety of the book of John so that you and I might align ourselves with Jesus with the King, with the King of kings and with the Lord of lords. You see, he's gone to the cross and died. It is taken into the tomb. Next week, Easter Sunday, he's going to be coming out of that tomb. But for now, he lies in a tomb for the likes of you and for me. That is how much he loves you. That is how much he loves me. 
That's how much he loves us. That's how great his heart is for us. He did all of this, every bit of it, for you and for me. Keep that in mind this week as we head into Easter. Keep in mind how great the love of God is for sinners just like us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for this remarkable story of the crucifixion. Lord, it's a story that many of us know so well, and we just pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would make it new and make it fresh to us, that once again this week and this Easter week, that you would again break our hearts, that you would quash our ugly sense of pride, that you would help us put behind us our sin. God, help us this week to fall at Jesus' feet and crown him Lord of all. God, again, we are so thankful for your blessing and for your love. And we just want to, as we conclude our time of worship today, Lord, if maybe there's somebody who's never heard this before. Maybe they didn't know that God loved them. Maybe they misunderstood that, that maybe they thought God was out to get them, wanted to punish them, wanted to curse them, wanted to get them. But that's not the God of the Bible. That's not Jesus. Jesus loves us. He loves us so much that he left perfect heaven where he was in perfect relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And he came down, he entered into our mess. He walked the earth that we walk. But you see the difference with Jesus is he lived a life we could not live and he died a death we could not die so that we, as sinners, could be set free. If you've never heard that before, I'd love to have you just reach out to me this week, send me a note, give me a call. I'd love to explain that in a deeper way to you. I'd love to share with you why Jesus loves you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter your history. It doesn't matter all of your sins. He loves you. Jesus, we love you as well. We thank you for your rich, your deep, your abiding love. Continue to be with us. Continue to protect us. Continue to watch over us. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Once again, thank you for stopping in. Thank you for watching this sermon and being part of the life of Glory Baptist Church. Whether you live in Aiken or you live on the other side of the world, if we could love you, if we could serve you, if we could pray for you, if we could be a blessing into your life, let us know and we will do our best to do so. Thank you. Have an awesome week. I'm praying for you. Make much of Jesus wherever this week leads you. Go and serve your King. Amen.